shall rise up to pray. I great God in heaven, we thank you for our worship service. We bless your name for bringing us together. We thank you because you want to do something great in every life, and we pray there will be nothing between us and you that will hinder your blessing in our lives in Jesus' name. We're asking, oh Lord, our blessings today and blessings tomorrow, blessings here on earth, and blessings in glory in heaven. You bring to everyone in Jesus' name. We know what Christ has done to grant us like this blessing. I will pray that whatever we need to do to come to Christ and to lean on Him and to trust Him, to have confidence in Him, to believe in Him without any shadow of doubt and to totally rely on Him. Lord, we pray you grant us that privilege and grace in Jesus' name. Touch every life. Turn us around. Help us, Lord, that in this life of ours will be everything you want us to be. We we'll pray that anything we seek which is not of you, take those things away from us. Anything that will hinder us from getting to glory on the final day, we we'll pray that you put all that away from every life in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, that here on earth, we'll do your will on earth as angels do that will in heaven. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we we'll pray. We're looking at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then the Lord said, All other things. Whatever it is, the things we desire, the things we love, the things we are praying for, and the things we seem to be passionate about, it says all those things shall be added unto us. You'll find in the statements of the Lord Jesus Christ, he talks about the kingdom, and he talks about righteousness, and he talks about not the kingdom of this world, the kingdoms that perish. It is not talking about an empire here in the world that many people are trying to build or to raise up. It's thinking of and talking about the kingdom of God, eternal kingdom, spiritual kingdom, everlasting kingdom, that holy righteous kingdom. And then he says, we'll seek not our own righteousness, not righteousness of religion, but his own righteousness. And then he says on the basis of that, all the other things shall be added unto us. I want to examine the scriptures with you on the power and the privilege of the righteous. The power and the privilege of the righteous. As we look at this, it's saying the privilege we have as we have his righteousness, the possessions we have as we have his righteousness, the provision we have as we have his righteousness, all things needed on earth will be added unto us. We're looking at uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. Are you here from verse 12? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. You're going to see as you go through your Bible, Old Testament to the New Testament, the great, great provision of the Lord for the righteous. The privilege the righteous people have and the power the righteous people have. Here it says that the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, over the righteous. And it says, and his ears are open unto their prayers. We pray for a lot of things, things we need personally and things we need in our families and things we need in our community, things we need in our church. And it says, if we want all those desires and all those petitions and all those items to be granted unto us, it's on the basis that we're righteous. And as a kind of righteousness is looking for, asking for, it says his eyes are open to the prayers of those righteous people. His ears are open to them. But then he says, but his face, the face of the Lord is against them that do what? That do evil, the righteous people. We're looking at James chapter 5. 
James chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that, your, that she may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You can see that everything positive, everything good, everything profitable is spoken about the righteous. And so that's why you want to find out what's true righteousness, transparent righteousness, triumphant righteousness, what the kind of righteousness the Lord demands. How do we have the kind of righteousness that God favors? And because of that, He's given us all the promises and the provisions, and He preserves, He protects, He promotes the people that are righteous. And He says, My eyes are over them, my mind is with them, my covenant is with them, and everything they need I grant unto them the power and the privilege of the righteous. There are three things we're looking at in the message. Number one, the price and the faith for true righteousness. That is a price that has been paid already and thank god you don't have to say i want to pay the price so i can be righteous somebody has paid the price already and we're going to look at that price that has been paid for your righteousness it's like something has been purchased something has been bought and because that thing has been purchased and bought then you accept that you receive that you possess that because it is paid for already it is bought already purchased already and then want to see the price that has been paid for the, your righteousness. And now the faith to stretch out your hands, the faith to trust, and the faith to believe, and the faith to have confidence. That righteousness was purchased for me. That righteousness was obtained for me. I cannot stretch forth my hands of faith and receive that righteousness, the price and the faith for true righteousness. Number two, purity and fruit of transparent righteousness when we talk of righteousness many people have ideas their own kind of ideas about righteousness some of them have some whitewashed outer external life during the day and a corrupt dirty defiled life in the night some of them some of the people their kind of ideas they have about righteousness they have a polished exterior and then a polluted interior. They're like the Pharisees, that they're like the whited sepulchre. And their righteousness is not transparent. Their righteousness is not continual. Their righteousness is only what they demonstrate or what they show or what they reveal or what they try to bring on the outside. And they have this a kind of covering that when you look at that, it looks like they're righteous, but on the inside, they are not really righteous. That's what the Lord is saying. The kind of righteousness is asking for that makes us to have the blessings transparent righteousness in the day and in the night. When others are there, when others are not there, in your thought, in your mind, in your heart, everything within, that even when the people that try to look at your life, they are not around you, I'm, I'm free now, I can do whatever I want. That's not righteousness. Transparent righteousness. The purity of that, the fruit of that, I come to number three, is the promotion and the divine favor. The promotion and the divine favor for triumphant righteousness. Righteousness triumphs. Good will triumph over evil. Righteousness will triumph over unrighteousness. Holiness will triumph over hypocrisy. And the righteous people on the final day, the saints of God, will triumph over the hypocritical religious people that do not truly and fully know the Lord, the promotion and the divine favor for triumphant righteousness. Because of triumphant righteousness and because of overcoming temptation, this is a kind of righteousness that is tried. A kind of righteousness that became tempted but stood in that temptation and still remained triumphant. Triumphant and righteous and because of that God gives the promotion of the divine people. Number one, number one is the price and the faith for true righteousness. There's false righteousness. You don't want to, you know, go through life carrying false righteousness. The righteousness of the first. Let me show you. In Matthew chapter 5, false righteousness and that doesn't win anything from the Lord. You want to make sure that the righteousness you have is true righteousness, false righteousness. Now, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, 
If I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes of the Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. There is the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And that kind of righteousness is false. That one, Christ did not pay any price for that. And the one you want to have is the one Christ paid a price for. The righteousness that is true. The righteousness that is genuine. Look at Luke chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 9. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. This is the kind of righteousness that has pride in it. See who I am. See what I have done. See what I am doing. Looking down on other people because they think it's just righteousness in their own thoughts. Righteousness in their tradition. Righteousness in their own kind of building up themselves. Being proud of other people. And here is what he said. Look at it in verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a public. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. This is the righteousness that's so comparing, always comparing themselves with other people. I'm better than other people, holier than other people, I'm higher than other people. Well, there's nobody in this life that is not higher than any other person. Even the thief is higher than the rogue, the rogue, the rogue and the robber. Even the one that's committing abortion might say I'm better than the one that is killing other people. At least those people are born already, but mine is not born yet. You know, if you are bad, you can compare yourself with other people. That doesn't justify you. That you say that the house of that person is dirty doesn't make you all clean. I'm higher than other people, holier than other, better than other people. That's false righteousness. And then it says in verse 12, I fast twice in the week. Uh -huh. that, that's, all, that's all they know. I fast in the week. I you don't wear shoes. I do this. I don't do that. And then it says, I give tithes of all I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. But his mote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me as sin. I tell you, this man, the publican, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that, what? Tell me out loud. Exalted himself like the Pharisee. I'm higher than others, holier than others, greater than others, better than others, more zealous than others. I give more than others. All the people that exalt themselves shall be abased. But he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Come to Matthew, false righteousness. Uh, you want to have the understanding of what true righteousness is so that you don't go all through your life pursuing that which amounts to nothing. In the sight of the Lord. Matthew chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 27. Who want you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. For even, even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men outwardly appear righteous unto men they walk in a sanctimonious way and they appear gentle they appear righteous they appear to be holy they appear to be correct they appear to be upright even the way they use language and the way they talk god bless you hallelujah praise the lord you'll think they were angels but it says it's only in the, in the outside only in the exterior they, they are not born again, they are not saved. And the real righteousness that Christ paid for has not become theirs. It says over here, it says, They appear unto men righteous, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. And that's what the Lord is saying, that we need to uh, look for what is that righteousness the Lord expects and what he wants. And then that is what we pursue. And we can only have that by faith. Philippians, I'm reading chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. 
that there's a kind of righteousness that is false a kind of righteousness that is unacceptable in the sight of the Lord and the Lord is saying seek that which is real seek that which is true and seek that which is uh, which you get by faith Philippians chapter 3 I'm reading from verse 6 it says concerning zeal persecuting the church and touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless can you think of somebody who says he's righteous and is persecuting a believer can you think of somebody who says he's righteous and is persecuting a real child of god can you think of somebody who says i'm righteous and yet is persecuting the people that love the lord and he says he he says he loves the lord he loves god the almighty and then he's persecuting the people that are following after the son of god after christ you can't imagine that but that's what saul was saul of tarsus he said concerning zeal he said i'm persecuting the church I was persecuting the church and yet it says touching the righteousness which is in the law it says blameless then it now says what things were gained to me those i counted laws for christ he said all that kind of righteousness worthless righteousness useless righteousness outward righteousness self-righteousness all that kind of zealous religious righteousness i have abandoned that they were gained to me but now it says i count them as dung and dust look at verse 8 it says yea doubtless and i count all things but laws for the excellency of the knowledge of christ jesus my lord for whom i have suffered the laws of all things and do count them but dung that i may win christ it says now i discover where that righteousness comes from the root of righteousness the source of righteousness and the path they have been with the channel by which that righteousness comes unto me it says in verse 9 and be, and be found and be found in him not having my own righteousness the one we're proud about i, I dropped that one I've thrown that one away. The one that comes through the Mosaic law, the old covenant. I've thrown that away. The one that comes through a kind of personal courage and personal drive and personal, uh, personal pursuit. The one that comes about trying and trying and trying. I've thrown all that away because that's the righteousness of man, which is useless in sight of God. It says now, but so that I can now, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. He says, that's what I'm seeking, that's what I've got. And that's what the Lord wants us to have, true righteousness. That's why it says that the price that has been paid for that true righteousness, let's look at the price now for true righteousness in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, I read from verse 17. For if by one man's offense death rage by one, much more, they that receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one jesus christ when the lord saw that we could not be righteous in the sight of god by ourselves in our own strength he then came he said i'll pay the price i'll die for them i'll shed my blood so that through the shed blood the blood of the lamb they will be able to have this righteousness which is valuable in the sight of the lord that's why it says now we have the gift of righteousness and we have the abundance of grace look at verse 18 it says therefore as by the offense of one 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 judgment came upon all men to condemnation even so by the righteousness of one the righteousness of christ the sinless life of christ the pure life of christ the holiness of christ and then because of that sinlessness and spotlessness and holiness of Christ, that's why I went to the cross to die for us. It says, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. It says that righteousness has been purchased by Christ. And then he gives it to us free, free of charge. We don't have to say, I'll pay this to have that righteousness. I'll, you know, give this to have that righteousness. We'll just come to him. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved and made righteous. Look at verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. 
That is by the disobedience of Adam, many of his offsprings became sinners. Then he says in verse 19, so by the obedience of one, the obedience of Christ, to become the sacrifice, the substitute, and to become our savior. By that obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ, that say, yes, I will, I'll go, I'll go to the world, I'll die for their sin. I go to the world and I will atone for their iniquity. I'll go to the cross and die for them. I'll bear their punishment. I'll bear all that they have done. Because of that, he says, now shall many be made righteous. It is through him now we're made righteous. Look at chapter 3. I'm reading chapter 3 from verse 10. In chapter 3 verse 10, it says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Nobody could have died for us except Christ because none righteous, no, not one. Nobody was so holy and so pure and so righteous and so upright that the fellow will say, I'm good enough by myself. I don't have to die for myself. I don't have any sin to die for. I'm going to die for them. There was none, nobody so righteous in themselves that could die for us. Only Jesus Christ was righteous enough, pure enough to be acceptable in the sight of the Lord and to die for us. Look at it now from verse 11. It says, There is none righteous, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. That is, nobody was so good that will say, I can die for them. I can pay the price of their salvation and the price for their righteousness. Nobody, no religious founder, and no religious leader, and nobody, no philanthropic person, and no good person was so good and so kind, so profitable, that could die for us. Only Jesus Christ could pay that price. And it brings everybody under the same fact. It says in verse 13, their throat is an open sepulchre. Is that the person to die for your sin or to die for himself? And it says with their tongues, they have used deceit, deceptive people, religious people. Are they qualified to die for our sins to pay the price? It says the poison of us is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swayed to shed blood, destruction, and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no, there is no fear of God before their eyes. That, that concludes uh, the, the life of all men. And so nobody was qualified to die for any other person except this Jesus Christ, the Holy One, the Righteous One, and the Pure One, and the Sinless One. He was the only one qualified to come and pay the price. That's why it says now in verse 20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. That is, everybody has the knowledge that they have seen. All have seen and come short of the glory of God. Come to verse 20, but now the righteousness of God. But now, it says, now that Christ has died, now that he paid the price, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, that is even all the law, the Old Testament law. They bear witness of this very fact that all have seen. They bear witness of this law that only Jesus Christ that came to fulfill the law of God perfectly. He was the only one and he is the only one that could have died for our sins. And he says also by the prophets. The prophets also bear witness. You remember Isaiah, unto us a child is born. He bore witness. Unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders. And then he says his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor of the Everlasting Father. He is the Prince of Peace. All those prophets bore witness. And then James says, The Lord, our righteousness. All those prophets, they bore witness that this Christ, He is the only one righteous enough. Holy enough and pure enough that will bear the shame and the indignity of our sins. In verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. The way that righteousness comes to us is by believing. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who has paid the, who has paid the price and is the full price that he paid. Come to verse 24. Be justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We are justified, we are forgiven, 
all our condemnation is taken away and all the past sin everything is taken away because we now believe on the lord jesus christ who paid the price verse 25 whom god has set forth to be the propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of god verse 26 to declare his saved at this time is righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth him which believeth him which believeth in jesus so then we understand it is by faith and it is by faith in the price that jesus paid because now he is he's a savior is a righteousness is a sanctification look at first corinthians chapter one first corinthians chapter one verse 30 but of him are ye in christ outside christ no redemption outside christ no salvation outside christ there's no righteousness maybe you've been coming to this church and you know you're just coming you cannot point to the day and the time when you voluntarily decided and gave your life to the lord jesus christ you just changed your dressing and then you just changed you bought a bible and then you found out the address of the church and you've been going there going there and then you are trying to change by little by little i used to smoke this i don't smoke that anymore i also drink that i don't drink that anymore i'm trying my best i'm improving upon my life you'll never try enough to get salvation you'll never improve to get salvation it comes by faith in christ that's why it's telling us here that Jesus Christ, he is a savior. He is the one that paid the price. There must be a moment in your life when you say, yes, Lord, I abandon my past. I give up my past and I come to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in a very definite way. And I can say, this is the place I gave my life to. And this is the time I really believe and I held on to him as my only savior. I lose confidence in myself that I could be anything by myself. But Jesus Jesus Christ, he is my Savior, my Lord. Look at this, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom. You know, some people, they think they have some wisdom outside Christ. They have some wisdom outside uh, what Christ has purchased for us. They say, I'm wise, I'm wise. And what they are talking about is satanic wisdom. What they are talking about is that sexual wisdom. What they are talking about is the earthly wisdom. What they are talking about is acquired wisdom. They read in books, so and so did this, this how so and so worked, and this how so and so did that, and that this one. They are trying to copy other people. That's not original wisdom. That's just human wisdom that will fail you in eternity. But Jesus Christ, He is a wisdom. And then it says it's a righteousness and sanctification and a redemption. I pray that that will be yours in Jesus' name. I'm looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he has made him to be seen for us who knew no sin. You see that? He made him to be the sin offering. He made him to be the sacrifice. He made him to be the one that carries away on our sins, and yet he had no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, so that as we believe on him, the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll become the righteousness of God in him. I come to point number two. This true righteousness, which we now call transparent righteousness, you know the life of Jesus Christ? He had a transparent righteousness. That's why he said, Which of you convinces me of sin? He said, I believe what before you. Everything I preach, everything I did, I did everything before. Examine me and find out which of you convinces me of sin. Transparent before his own disciples, transparent before the women, transparent before the government, transparent everywhere. Transparent righteousness. Can you say that? You know, the police people that meet you on the road and they say, hi about your particulars. Can you say you have transparent righteousness? The people you are working with, the men and the women behind closed doors, can you say transparent righteousness? In making money and doing this and doing that in your business, can you say transparent righteousness? 
as you travel up and down, you're a businessman, you do business there, you do business there, and then you do this. Can you see transparent righteousness in your discussions and in your uh, kind of uh, interaction with people? Can you tell them which of you convinced me of sin? Because they're transparent, try trusting in your transactions and deals, the things that you do. Can you say there's transparent, try trustness? You see, the Pharisees, all those Pharisees, the religious people were righteous, were righteous. It was only righteous in the noonday, not righteousness in the midnight. It wasn't righteous when everybody was looking at them. When people turned their backs, there was no righteousness anymore. Those were hypocritical people. And they only appeared righteous unto people that did not know them. They are righteous before children that do not know their left or their right. And if whatever they tell the children, the children accept, you know, I am righteous. And the children say, yes, you are righteous. What do they know? But the people that know them inside out, they know they are not righteous. But we're talking about the righteousness that is transparent, that by the grace of God, this is what God has given you. I pray you'll have it in Jesus' name. That transparent righteousness has purity in it. And when we get to the gates of heaven eventually, and God looks at our records, he sees that you have been so washed and so cleansed of the blood of the Lamb. Your intentions, your attitude, your thoughts, your motives, everything within, the thing that even made you to do what you, not just the outward act, but even the inside, the motive, the intention, all that purified the porch before the Lord. That's the transparent righteousness we're talking about. And it's the fruit of this gift of righteousness we get from the Lord. And let's look at this, the fruit of righteousness. Righteousness as fruit. Righteousness as something it shows, something it demonstrates. And that's what's important. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, it's unfortunate for men and women, for, you know, church goers, for people. When you first came to know the Lord, the only thing that matters to you is the will of God, the mind of God, the word of God. You took a decision by yourself. I'm going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because he died for me. At that time, you didn't think of what will Mr. So-and-so say, what will Madam So-and-so say, what will Daddy say, what will Mommy say. The only thing that was important, Jesus died for me. It was Jesus and I, me and Jesus. All I want to do is accept him and receive him and believe him. Whatever people think about my decision, that doesn't matter to me. Whatever evaluation, whatever they put on my action, whatever, it doesn't matter to me. The only thing that matters to me here is Jesus. He died for me. I belong to him. Finish. And then the people who don't understand, they might persecute you. That's their problem. They might speak against you. That's their problem. And you are not trying to prove anything to anybody. You know, I did this because of this. I went there because of this. I'm going to this church because of this. You didn't have to prove anything to anybody. Once the Lord is satisfied and pleased, that was all. But after you become Christian, born again, after some time now, you want to, you know, take a little step. What will they say? What will they think? How will they evaluate this? What will my pastor say? What will my leader say? If I appear like this, how will they think about me? And then you are no more transparent. You are not doing anything to please the Lord anymore. It is now because of that person and that person and that person. That's no more righteousness. But the transparent righteousness that goes back to the origin, that goes back to the first time you came to know the Lord. It doesn't matter what they think about me. It doesn't matter what they say about me. It doesn't matter how they act towards me. The only thing I know, I want to get to heaven. And it's Jesus and I, it's me and Jesus. And I want to get there on that final day. And whatever they think about me today will not matter. Because when we come to that judgment seat of the Lord, it is what they think of. They may think you're 100% righteous. And God may say you're 0% righteous. No righteousness there. And so you want to think about that today, the transparency that ought to be in the life of the righteous, the purity and the fruit of transparent righteousness. I'm looking at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 9. And this I pray. 
that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all in all judgment that she may prove approve things that are excellent that your life all you're thinking about is what is excellent and then it goes on that she may be sincere and without offense till the day of christ being filled for the fruits of righteousness being filled for the fruits of righteousness being filled for the fruits of righteousness unto the glory and the praise of god he says all i want to do is to bring glory to god is to bring praise to god all that matters to me is how does god think about this how does God evaluate this? How does God appreciate this? How does this please the Lord? That's the fruit of righteousness. Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading here from verse 9. From verse 9 it says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. All righteousness and truth. You found people, they say they are believers. They have to kind of modify the truth. They have to kind of cut some corners. You know why? They want to appear righteous before you. And they don't want you to say, did you do that? How could you have done that? I thought you were righteous. And so to still, you know, kind of protect their image before you. That's why they have to doctor that thing. That's why they have to cut the corners. That's why they have to adjust those seeds. They know what they have done. And if you did this in good faith, if it was a mistake, that you did it, you know that you were sincere, that you felt you were pleasing the Lord, and somebody say, hey, what did you do? This is what I did. This is what I did. This is what I did. You don't have to think and, and kind of, let me know how to put this now, here and there. And then you are trying to modify. Why are you doing that? You want to please that person. You want them to think you are righteous. Tell them what has happened. If you have a clear conscience before the Lord, it doesn't matter what they think or what they say. You know, when you try to cut all those seeds and modify those seeds, and then you do it this way, do it that way, because of the way they will think, that's no more transparent. Be transparent and let them judge whatever they want to say. Let them say whatever. Because you know that you are dealing with God, you are not dealing with man. It says over here, the fruit of the Spirit, you know, righteousness and truth. Look at this in verse 10. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, not unto man. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Do you know there are many things that are acceptable to the Lord and not acceptable to men? Why? Because men are not God. Because men don't always think the way God thinks. In fact, you've had a million people. All those million people, something may please a million people and it may not please God. And something may please God and not please a million people. So, if all you are thinking about what will please 10,000 people and please 50,000 people and please a million people, you'll never please God. Leave all those men alone. Leave all the women alone and say, on the final day, the things that will matter is how God approves or disapproves of my action. How God approves or disapproves of my decision. How God approves or disapproves of my way of life. And if it is pleasing unto the Lord, the opinions of men are nothing. And the opinions of you know your friends, they are nothing. All you want to find out is, is this transparent righteousness in the sight of the Lord, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, because it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. We're looking at uh, Romans chapter 6. Transparent righteousness. What kind of righteousness is that? Romans chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 16. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, is servants ye are to whom ye obey. If you're always thinking about man, what do they think? What will they say? How will they look at this? You'll become the servants of men. You'll be like a puppet. They tie rope in your leg. And then they'll be pulling you here and there. You'll not even be a man of your own. You'll not have a man. You'll not be a man of your own decision. A man of your own life. A man that you will be responsible to. Here is what I'm going to do. If I'm wrong, I'm responsible. If I'm right, I'm responsible. 
here is what I'm going to do. If it comes out well, I'm responsible. If it doesn't come out well, I'm responsible. That's a man. That's a woman that says, here is who I'm going to serve. I'm going to serve the Lord. Whether they accept it or not, that's not my problem. But I'm going to serve the Lord. And this is the direction in which I'm going to go. Whether the people, whether they appreciate that or not, it doesn't matter. They might be gossiping about you, slandering you. What does that matter? The slanders of men, the comments of men, or whatever they say behind, even if they say it to your face, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is this is what God wants. And you're obedient to the Lord. But if you are all the time, you're always thinking, I want to please that, you'll be a servant. I want to please her, you'll be her servant. And you know, those of us who are married, you before you got married, or you want to please, you want to please the Lord. And all the people that believe the Bible, they all they wanted to do was to please the Lord. But you know, after they are married, and then little by little by little, all you want to do now is to please your husband. It's wonderful if your husband is a real Christian. It's wonderful if your husband has the mind of Christ. It's wonderful if everything the Lord says your husband, your husband agrees with. But if your husband does not agree with this, this, and this, and say, yeah, I know that's what Jesus said. That's what God wants. But me, your husband, this is what I want. And now you are saying, oh Lord, I would have done it this way, your own way. But now this is what my husband wants. Uh-huh, you become a slave. Not a spouse, a slave to that man. The same thing, turn it around. If it's husband and wife, the husband knows here is the way to go. But the wife is saying, if you went that way, are you showing that you love me more than Jesus? Love me more than heaven? If I wanted you to go to hell and you really love me, wouldn't you go to hell just for my sake? No, sir. I will go to hell for your sake. How many wants to go to hell for somebody else's sake? Raise up your hand. You want to go to hell for somebody's sake? No. You want to know that it is not, you know, if you're a servant of your wife, that's even terrible enough. But if you know that this is the way, what keep daring, and you know that this is the path to heaven, you say, I'm going to please the Lord. My wife, if you want to, you know, follow, follow. If you don't want to follow, it's better for one person to get to heaven than for two people to go to hell. If you follow this, the way of the Lord, we'll get to heaven together. Give me a good amen. amen. But if you decide that that's the way you want to go, this is the way I'm going, I'm going to get to heaven, you'll get to that heaven in Jesus' name. You see, the people that have got that righteousness from the Lord, and they say, these are the way to go, and they want to stand by that for the rest of their lives, that's what they're talking about. That thing is profitable. When you say you are going to follow the Lord, and then you're not just obeying people, obeying people, whether they're right or wrong, and then you become slaves of men. And then, they, you know, instead of having faith in God, you have the fear of man. And then they control you by that kind of fear of man. Look at that verse 16 again. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey. His servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked. Look at this, a transparent thing now. But God be thanked that ye were servants of sin. But ye have obeyed. Tell me. Tell me out loud. That's the kind of righteousness we're talking about. You have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being made, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness free from sin free from sin that's transparent righteousness that whether people are there or not you're not you're not escaping sin because of me you're not avoiding sin because of me the lord the spirit of god is saying that is sinful oh the pastor is not here i can do that that is sinful the gs is not around i can do that you're not a christian then you're not a christian because of me you're not righteous because of me you're not holy because of me. You're not resisting the devil because of me. 
you're resisting devil because of yourself because you have a covenant with the lord you know some people my wife is not there so i can i can do this i can you know go this far if my wife was there i couldn't do that are you a christian because of your wife are you a christian because you believe in the lord jesus christ and you know that whether your wife is there or not your husband is there or not that this is the way to go this is the thing to do that's christianity but you know this kind of christianity you know my husband is not around i can do that my wife is not there i can do that the pastors are not here i can do it. my sexual leader is not there so i can do that and the pastor will never discover this i can do it. that's not christianity to spirit righteousness i pray that the lord will make us peel through and through in jesus name uh, so it says in verse 22 look at verse 22 and being now made free from sin become servants to god and ye have your fruit unto holiness and the edge everlasting life we're looking at first timothy chapter 6 first timothy chapter 6 and i'm reading here from verse 6 first timothy chapter 6 verse 6 righteousness transparent righteousness it says in first Timothy chapter 6 verse 6 but godliness with contentment is great gain godliness with contentment is great gain are you content do you have contentment with what you have you know sometimes in the church here is the position you have praise the lord that's all god has given me now i'm, I'm happy this opportunity comes and goes this opportunity i have to praise the lord i'm happy with what i have you have a little church there and God has made you a leader over them. You're not envious of another person, jealous of another person. And you have this congregation that are willing to hear the word of God and they're hearing the word of God. You're not jealous of another one. Another person has, you know, multiplied of what you have. There's no problem. You are contented with what you have. That's righteousness. But you know, he has got that. I must chase after him and get it. He is over there, I must run after him and, you know, overtake him. And he is uh, managing that, I must run after him and, and, you know, chase what he has. That's not Christianity anymore. But, you know, you are here in life that you even have food to eat and raiment to put on. What a glorious thing that is. Look at verse 7. It says, for we brought nothing into the world. And it is certain that can carry nothing out. You know how many people have lost their lives because, you know, I want riches, I want property, I want land, I want houses, I want this, I have this. Those who came out from school at the same time, see where they are. How did they get this? Aha, uh -huh. it's the kind of church they are going. Okay, I'm going to leave this place because they don't talk much about property here, about, you know, stock exchange, about whatever. They don't talk about that. They don't talk about strategy to climb and make money and succeed here. I'm going to that other place so I can have what they have. They're not chasing after righteousness. What they want is property. Other people is that they're working somewhere. And if that is the place God wants them to work, the salary is not enough here. I want to go to another place and have salary. And then when they get to that place, they're getting something they've heard of another place where there's, they are not going to have chance for Bible study, for worship, or for some doctrine. But there's money there. They're running there again. You lose your soul. Because you see, your aim and your pursuit is no more righteousness. Look at this in verse 8 and having food and raiment. Let us be there with content. Then it says, but they that will be rich by all means. I must get it. I must have it. I must possess it. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful laws which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money, tell me. Tell me again. The love of money, the love of money is the root of all evil. And you know many people, they say this is our church. In all that we have been teaching all this time, when are we going to change? So that now, you know, release us so we can go into politics. Release us so we can do all kinds of business. Because you said know, in this and that, this, it doesn't bring money. Why don't you release us so we can sell alcohol? Why don't you release us so we can sell this and that? Or, who, who is delaying you? I'm not, I'm not tying you down. Whatever you want to sell, you can sell. If you know that you want to be righteous and you want to make other people righteous, that's what controls what you sell, what you don't sell. 
but release us. I'm not tying you down. All we're saying is if you want to get to heaven, there must be transparent righteousness, but they want release. They seek his church, delaying them or restraining them from selling this and selling that and going here and going there and doing this kind of business and joining with unbelievers to do whatever. Nobody is restraining you. It's the word of God that restrains those who want to get to heaven. That's why it says, they that will be rich, they fall into a lot of things. Then it says, in verse, uh, look at verse 10, for, they, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which one some converted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I pray God will deliver us. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness. Transparent, transparent. And then in your heart you say, is there anything in this life I cannot give up for God? Is there anything so precious and so great that I'm tied down to it? That I love that thing more than heaven, love that thing more than righteousness, love that thing more than Christ. Is there anything that is so great that is gripping my heart, holding me down, that I cannot get up and then move on in pursuing the goal the Lord has set before me? When you think about it like that, maybe there are some, maybe it's money, maybe it's fame, maybe it's position, maybe it's power, maybe it's politics, maybe it is whatever, that you can do anything and then you swear away from, from Christianity and from righteousness. I pray that the Lord will make us and say in Jesus' name. And now, O oh man of God, woman of God, it says, follow, I flee these things and follow after righteousness and godliness and faith and love and patience and meekness fight the good fight of faith give me a good amen yeah. you, you know you have to fight your own flesh that's a good fight of faith and you fight your own propensities you fight whatever is drawing you you're not fighting me you're not fighting uh, uh brethren you're not fighting you know the church you're fighting your own flesh you're fighting the world you're fighting the devil because the devil wants to tie you down to this and your own mind your own desires your own aspirations your own ambition that's what you fight so that you can keep in this path that leads to heaven you know the, the devil will dangle uh, something glittering before you not everything that glitters is gold and the devil will say, if you fall down before me, I will, I will give the whole of the kingdoms of the world unto you. And your mind is likely to be tending towards that and leaning towards that. That's what you fight. Fighting the good fight of faith. And then it says to lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Uh, the grace to fight such a fight, not to fight a uh, paper, not to fight a uh, you know elusive battle, but to fight the right kind of fight. I pray the Lord will give unto us in Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy chapter two verse nineteen. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knows them that are His, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ do what. Depart from iniquity, just to just know, you know, sometimes you're in a place and you don't know what is there is iniquity. Sometimes they call you to a position. You don't know that there's idolatry behind the chair there. You don't know there's idolatry under the chair there. You don't know there's occultism inside that thing. I just, you know, just innocently, they just got into that employment. Innocently, they just call you to that position. Innocently, they just call you to that association. And then as you get in like this, lo and behold, the very foundation is occultism. And the very surrounding is um, demonism or whatever. You say, this cannot be. Immediately you discover that. You say, oh Lord, what am I finding myself in? I didn't know this before. I thought everything was plain. They advertised it in the papers. They announced over the radio, over internet, and they said, this is good. This will give you, and the moment they knew you were a Christian, and then you made application innocently. You just got in there. And then they say, we're going to pull this one in. And if we pull him in or pull her in, she's going to lose all that faith in Christ. But you didn't know. But the moment you, and then they promised you, you're going to have this and this and that. And they saw you were receiving where you were before. Now everything is like more than double. And they're going to give you a house and give you a car and give you a driver, give you everything. And then you got getting like this. It's it discovered that this is the very foundation of iniquity. This one will spread satanism 
all over. Immediately, you see that if your mind is not attached to, you know, mulch and sand and cement, if your mind is not attached to anything, anything on earth, and your mind is always, always in heaven, always with Christ, immediately you see that this is evil. You quit, and God will give you grace. That's why it says, let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Look at verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from this, it shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Verse 22. Flee also your full loss, but follow righteousness. You see, that's the pursuit. That's the number one thing in your heart. Your priority is if I'm able to have this and say righteousness, okay, but if I cannot keep the righteousness except I drop it and have this, let that thing go. That thing will go in your life in Jesus' name. It says, but it says, uh, but follow righteousness and faith and charity and peace with them that call on the name of the Lord out of a pure heart. I'm looking at First John chapter three. First John chapter three. What are you doing from verse one? First John chapter three, verse one. In First John chapter three, verse one, be, behold, what manner of love the Father has, has bestowed upon us that we shall be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I pray that will be yours. And every man, and every man, and every man that has this hope in him, purifies himself even as he is pure. Everyone that has this hope, it, it, it finds that in him, he purifies himself even as he is pure. But you know, if you never look into the mirror, Sometimes you'll go out without, you know, combing your hair, and you'll not know, because you never looked at the mirror. Sometimes, if you never look at the mirror, you'll not see some dirt on your face, some dirt on your body. If you never look at the mirror, your back may be, you know, kind of stained, and you don't know. If you never look at the mirror, your clothes that you're wearing out may be all wrong, and you didn't know. The mirror of the Word of God is what makes us to be ready for the rapture every time and every moment. If you never come back to the Bible, oh, you say, I know my conscience. My conscience is right. My conscience does not condemn me. And you never look into the mirror of the word of God. I know my, I have a good intention. I have a good ambition. A good aspiration. I want to serve the Lord. I've decided to follow the... You never look into the mirror of the word of God. But he that has this hope in him. As you are looking at the mirror. And you say, ah, your mind is going astray that way. Your, your mind is going astray that way. Your mind is going astray that way. And then you are just. You purify yourself. Even as... He is pure. Look at verse 4. And it says, Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. But if you don't know the law of Christ, if you don't know the law of the new covenant, how do you know that you are transgressing that law of the new covenant? If you never read it, if all you have is that I go to church, I, you know, sing the song, I, I read the Bible, but you never read the new covenant that were given, the New Testament in particular, and it says, and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him, what does it say? Tell me out loud. You know, the people that don't read the Bible, they come to our church, they don't read the Bible. They say, nobody is perfect. Nobody is perfect. Somebody will call, has his own sin. This one may be committing that sin. That one may be committing sin. And they even say that so-and-so is committing sin. They still call him brother. They say so-and-so is committing sin. They still call her sister. They don't understand the word of God. And they themselves, they say, well, they say they are not perfect. They are committing sin. They confess. They are living in sin. And they still call themselves children of God. But look at this in verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. And then it says, whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. The people that even play with sin, they joke with sin deliberately. They do something sinful. And they say, ah, ah, did you take that? I was just joking. How about if your child is joking and play with poison? 
And your child, she's giving her own junior sister, junior brother, a seed to drink. Hey, what are you doing? Uh, mommy, you take me, I'm just, I'm just playing. You're playing with acid. But sin is more dangerous than acid. And you're playing with sin. Playing with lying. Playing with hypocrisy. Playing with covetousness. You pick money. And then, ah, how about that? Uh, uh, you can't, that's, I was just joking. I wasn't going to, you know, see. If, of course, if you didn't see me, I'll go and spend it. But because after all, you are a brother, I'm a brother, and I took it. And then you see his bold face. That one is on his way to hell. I pray God will deliver us in Jesus' name. The people that do not know that when you become a believer, you become a real child of God, sin is out of your life. And that whether you are playing or you're serious, sin is sin. And you're not going back into sin anymore in your life in Jesus' name. And that, you know, those are the people who are born again. And they, they have the mind that all I want is to get to heaven. And because I want to get to heaven, anything that smells of sin, anything that appears to be sinful, you want to cancel that in your life. You want to be able to say, praise the Lord by the grace of God. The devil comments and he has nothing in me. Those are the people that are being claimed every day being purged every day to get themselves prepared for the coming of the Lord. Look at that in verse 6 again. It says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Look at verse 8. He that committeth sin is committed member of deeper life. What does it say? of the devil. He that committed sin is of the devil. You know, the people who worship personality. Those personalities that they commit sin, they live in sin. And when you discover it, they say, hey, go talk to other people. I'm a member of deeper life. I'm so and so in deeper life. It doesn't matter. You might be so and so in deeper life. If you're living in sin, you're of the devil. And if Christ comes, you'll miss heaven. If you died in that condition, no matter who you are. Because the word of God is no respect of persons. And here it says, he that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might, tell me, destroy the works of the devil. I pray that every work of the devil, every sin, the Lord will destroy from your life in Jesus' name. Whosoever is born of God, does not commit sin. Praise the Lord. For his seed remaineth, abideth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. What's the promotion of those people who have this kind of righteousness, true righteousness, transparent righteousness, triumphant righteousness? Think about Joseph. Transparent, triumphant righteousness. See the promotion. Think about Daniel. Transparent, triumphant righteousness and see the promotion. Think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then the Kadena said, What am I hearing? That you're not bowed down to my idol. Uh -uh. I'm going to give you another chance. Hold, hold your breath. If it is so that you throw us in, let it be very clear to you the kind of righteousness we have is not righteousness in peaceful times. Righteousness when everything is all right. Righteousness under the smile of the king. Even under the frown of the king. Under the frown of the persecutors. There's still righteousness. Go make your fire. Be it known unto you. We're not going to bow down to your idol. That's triumphant righteousness. I pray God will give it to us in Jesus' name. I want you to look at Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. I'm reading here from verse 1. Genesis chapter 7 verse 1. We're reading about uh, this Noah that had triumphant righteousness. And the Lord said, Noah, come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. That man kept on building the ark. They made fun of him. He kept on building the ark. They jested about him, he kept on building the ark. They persecuted, he kept on building the ark. They slandered, he kept on building the ark. He said, I don't care. I've heard the word of the Lord. You may not believe, they may not accept, but here is what the Lord has said. And God said, you are the only one I found righteous in this generation. 
that man was triumphant i pray you'll be triumphant in jesus name i'm looking at genesis chapter 5 reading from verse 22 and enoch walked with god after after he begat me to sell 300 years and begat sons and daughters and all the days of Enoch were 300, 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and it was not for God to keep. That man was righteous. His wife were not told that the wife was raptured. The children, sons and daughters, even Methuselah, were not told that they were righteous. But the man said, whether family members agree or not, whether they approve of this or not, whether they go all through all the way with me or not, I'm going to be transparently righteous. He was triumphantly righteous. That's why God took him. Those who are going to make it in the rapture eventually, like Enoch. There will be people that uh, they are not doing it to please anybody. They say, this is the way of the Lord. And that's what they are going to do. It's the people that make up their minds. And they say that this is the way to go. And whether anybody agrees or anybody does not agree, they know that this is how to work with God. And with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, all their commitment and consecration, they are working with God, transparently righteous. Those are the people going to make it. I pray you will make it in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Genesis chapter 39, triumphant righteousness. And those are the only kind of people that are promoted by the Lord, promoted here on earth, and promoted to glory eventually. Genesis chapter 39, I'm reading from verse 2, and the Lord was a Joseph. And he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Come on down now to verse 9, or maybe verse 7. And it came to pass after these things that the, the master's wife, that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and said, Lie with me. And he refused. And he refused. And he refused. You know, there are some people, you even respect them. How could Madame so and so say that? Well, don't worry about that. She's back to me, but you will refuse. I said, you will refuse. You know, some people say, this is not my fault. I didn't go to her. I didn't initiate this and say she is the one that is saying that. What could I have done? What you can do is to refuse. What you can do is to say, I have heaven before me. I have glory before me. And because I have glory and heaven before me, that's, that's what I think about. And they were told, he refused. And then we're told, uh, verse uh, Verse 8, he refused and said unto his master, So I behold, my master wotteth and knoweth not what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I. None greater in this house than I. Praise God for Joseph. I said, Praise God for Joseph. You know, some people, they told us in geography, the higher you go, the cooler you become. Some people in religion, the higher they go, the cooler they become. The higher they go, the more faithful they become. The, the carefulness they used to have, the perspective of righteousness, holiness they used to have, the higher they go in the service of the Lord, the higher they go in the things of the Lord, the, the cooler they become, the more careless they become. But Joseph said, I've become great here. The Lord has exalted me here, and it's not greater in this house than I. Neither has he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? You see that? And, and that's what we need to have today. That kind of passion for righteousness. That kind of zeal for righteousness. Transparent, triumphant, righteousness. True righteousness. And then we're told in verse 10, And it came to pass, as, the, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass, about this time, that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by the garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand, tell me, and fled and got him out. This man wanted to get to heaven, he is now in heaven. If you want to get to heaven, whatever, if your right hand will cause you to sin against God, what do you do? Cut it off. And if your right hand will cause you to sin against God, 
you pluck it out so that by the grace of God that heaven you'll get there. You know, heaven is not a cheap getting to heaven. It's through this kind of righteousness, true righteousness, transparent righteousness, triumphant righteousness. It is not cheap. And as you make up your mind that the grace of God will help you, that grace will help you in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Daniel chapter 3. Persecution will come. Persecution will come. When you make up your mind that you are going to be righteous, but in the face of persecution, persecutors, you still say, this is where I stand. And I pray God will hold you up as you stand in Jesus' name. Daniel chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 14. The Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up now. If ye be ready, at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, and the harp, and the scatterbot, and satri, and drosima, and all kinds of music, and ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well, but if ye worship not, he shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? You know, when some people brag like that and they say, Who is that God? And they're so bold that to blaspheme. Some people, because of that, will fear that man more than they fear God. They say, ah, This man is serious. This man is another, this man is terrible, this man is another thing. And if we don't do, do this thing, it is not just a sin it for you know to threaten us, it's going to actually do it. Well, what if he did it? God will protect you. What if he did it? God will preserve your life. You know, and there's no testimony without a test. And there's no miracle. If we don't pass through something like this, there'll be no miracle. It is when those enemies threaten. And it is when those people say, if you keep on serving the Lord, this is what we are going to do. And the minute they're really going to do it, that's the time you experience a miracle. A miracle is coming your way. You know when you take your son and say, I have a righteousness, transparent righteousness, and come with me, I'm going to keep on serving the Lord until he comes. Miracles will never leave you in Jesus' name. And look at it in verse 16. And shake up Meshach and Abednego answered and said unto the king of Nebuchadnezzar, We are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able. Our God whom we serve is able. I said, Our God whom we serve is able. Say that with me. Our God whom we serve is able. Say that again. Our God whom we serve is able. Say that again. You know, anytime you are confronted by these uh, people, blasphemous people, persecuting people, people, you know, lawless people, they say, if you don't do this, we're going to do that. Sometimes there are even people that a little church going in their background. And then they say, you know, we go to church, but if you don't do this, you're going to lose your job. If you don't do this, you're going to lose this and that. So tell them, go ahead. A God whom we serve is able, is able to deliver us from your hand, from your body, very fondness, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Be it known unto you, it says, but if not be it known unto you, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image when thou art set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar, what? Tell me. You know, there are some people, I, I don't understand. They say they believe in Christ, the, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah. They, be, they say they believe in Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And they're so timid. And if any Nebuchadnezzar or Pharaoh or Herod or, or Nero or whatever, uh, you know, threatens them, uh, they'll be like, you know, chicken or hens that will pour water on. No courage. No heart, no mind. They lose sight of heaven immediately because of the threats of Nebuchadnezzar. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, thank God I'm their junior brother. I said, thank God I'm their junior brother. They are their junior brother, junior sister in Jesus' name. We have the same family. And the same faith runs in our vein. And the same blood runs in our vein. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Where, where, where are the family members of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Praise the Lord. We're going to stand in Jesus' name. Let them threaten. Let them brag. 
this God, we're going to serve him until the very end. Yeah. And I'm telling you, after Nebuchadnezzar had become an animal in the bush, we'll still be standing for the Lord. Yeah. After Belshazzar, his own son, had been dealt with by the hand of the rod of the Almighty King, we will still be serving the Lord in Jesus' name. No, Nebuchadnezzar will take this righteousness away from us in Jesus' name. And so Nebuchadnezzar became full of fury. Let them get angry. That's, that's their trade. And it says, and the form of his business, business will change. He gets shaped like Meshach and Abednego. Therefore, he spake and commanded that they should eat the furnace once seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And, and he commanded the most mighty men. That's why in the army, those people, they wanted to lose their lives. Anybody that wants to touch you, he wants to lose his life. As anybody that wants to touch you, he wants to lose his life. And it says to pine Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning into burning furry furnace. And these men were bound in their coats and their hosing and their hearts and their all their garments, and they were cast into the midst of the burning furry furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach. Shadrach and Abednego. Give me a good amen there. Yeah. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fairy furnace. And then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished. And he rose up in haste and spake and said unto the council, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said, uh, and said unto them, True, O king, he answered and said, Lo, I see. Lo, I see. Lo, I see. Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire. Walking in the midst of the fire. Can you walk in the midst of the fire? I said, can you walk in the midst of the fire? You can walk in the midst of the fire, sitting down, walk in the midst of the fire. I said, walk in the midst of the fire. I said, walk in the midst of the fire. You know, all these three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I told them, my senior brothers, I said, they're my senior brothers, we're from the same family, we're serving the same God, we have the same promise, we have the same covenant, and we're going to that same heaven, and then in the midst of the fire, we're not going to run away. Are you running away? It says they walk in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt, nothing will touch your life. And the form and the form and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He will be with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And nobody will be able to destroy you in the mighty name of Jesus. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to walk in the midst of that fire. What does it matter? What does it matter? Whatever they say, whatever they do, I'm serving the Lord. I'm going to keep on serving the Lord. Transparent holiness, true holiness, triumphant holiness. Holiness, holiness, holiness. Holiness are what word and song. Shout it. Say it aloud. I said, I'm going to serve the Lord. Make sure you have given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ that you are born again. And then as you have been born again and giving your life to the Lord and say, I'm following this path of righteousness, true righteousness and transparent righteousness and triumphant righteousness, nothing is going to beat me back. Nothing is going to hinder me. I'm going to serve the Lord until my last breath. Whatever they say, whatever they do, however they threaten, I'm going to serve the Lord till my latest breath. You're not going to slow down, wind down, bend down, no, ever, forward ever, forward ever, forward ever, backward never. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We'll tread them down, we'll march them down, we'll trample on them. Serving the Lord, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And don't you ever fear anyone, be timid because of anyone, but pedally slowing down, softening because of anyone.
Relinchi because of anyone. Follow peace with men and holiness without which no man shall say the Lord. Without holiness, no man shall say the Lord. Holiness is still a watch word and song. It's a life, it's a pattern, it's a language, it's a manner of life. Saved, sanctified, made righteous and holy. Don't allow the fear of man to take salvation from you. Don't allow the fear of man to take righteousness away from you. If your senior brothers want you to the fire, can't you bear a little frown? A little jesting, a little slander, a little persecution. If your senior brother Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went through the fire, can't you go through a little persecution, a little disappointment, a little pressure? Those who've gone before us. Joseph went into prison upholding that righteousness. Can't you bear a little problem? Heaven is our home, heaven is our goal. Don't be a bread and butter Christian. Only looking for healing. Only looking for prosperity. Once persecution comes, they can't stand. Don't be like that. Always looking for the praise of men. Always looking for a little encouragement. Soft and sissy, effeminate, weak, no spine, no backbone, no be a Christian like that. You can take a little more pressure, a little more persecution, a little more fire, a little more hotness of the of the of the forties. Your place of work, your community, that's where you live. The jesting and the jeering of those people making fun of you. Little name calling, little lies they tell against you. You can bear a little more of that. Be like your brothers in Bible days. Like Daniel. And the king came and said, Daniel, oh Daniel, it's your God whom you serve, the night able to deliver you out of the mouth of the Daniel. Oh, King live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the mouth of the lions that he hurt me not. Seen before you and before him. I've done no evil, no hurt. Righteous. 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 You're not looking for the praise of men. You're not looking for pity from men. You're looking for sympathy from men. If men accept you, all right. If they reject you, all right. If they cooperate, all right. If they oppose, all right. If they go along with your right, if they try to hinder you, no problem, no problem. You made up your mind you are going to serve the Lord, serve Him in holiness and righteousness all the days of your life. Don't stop until you enter through those gates into heaven. Don't stop. 
until you hear the trumpet sound and the dead in Christ rise and then you are caught up to be with them in the air don't stop until the day of rapture sage sanctified made righteous and holy ready for the rapture don't stop don't stop your journey halfway serving until the end